Y'all can take a seat. All right, it's good to be back. Uh, I'm excited about uh, what is to come for the next few weeks. Uh, show me your books. Show me your books, okay? Uh, raise your hand if you didn't get one, okay? A couple of you didn't. Make sure on your way out you grab one of these. Uh, and I just want to chat about it with you guys for a minute um, because this is really going to kind of be what drives us for the next uh, four or so weeks together. And so I'm going to open to kind of just a random day, okay? So I am at day nine. Um, if you want to flip to that, I just kind of want to show you what we're going to be doing together for the next 28 days, okay? And so you're going to read just a few verses, okay? A few verses each day. Um, then there's going to be an observation from some of your very own small group leaders that wrote this thing up. There are going to be a couple questions uh, for reflection. There's going to be a challenge. So like on day nine, you'll see the challenge is to throw away someone's trash after lunch today. Uh, that day is talking about how Jesus came to serve and took up the nature of a servant uh, to die for us. And then there's a song of the day that we'll encourage you to listen to before you go to bed or when you wake up, when you do this, and then there is a prayer. And, uh, and so here's kind of the reality. You can go as deep as you want to with this. If you wanted to, you could make this last two minutes every day, for real. And then if you do the song, it'd be like seven, all right? Like the verses are, I mean, the verse is like literally a couple sentences each day, all right? Um, you could kind of just check it off the list. But the reason that we just included a few, verse, a few verses is it gives you guys an option. It gives you guys an option for those of you guys that want to go deeper into it and spend some time in it, you have the option to. For some of you, like, ah, I'll just, at least you're getting some, and you can kind of, you know, do it, do it pretty quick, all right? But I would encourage you, if you want to get the most out of this, spend some time. Spend some time meditating on the verses. Do your best to maybe memorize one of the verses each day, or at least be thinking about it. Maybe write it out, put it in your pocket during the day, and, and have that, you know, with you at school, to where you can kind of really grow in this, in this journey for 28 days in your faith and kind of understanding how to maybe read your Bible, understanding how to actually live your faith out. All right, so this is a journey that we're going to be going on. Uh, how many of you guys follow our Instagram account? Okay. How many of you guys don't follow our Instagram account? Okay. If you have Instagram, take out your phone right now and follow OBCC underscore students. Okay. OBCC underscore students. And what we're going to do is that every night, okay, around 9 p.m., the goal is to go live every night at 9. We're going to call it live at 9, all right? And we're going to have we're going to have one of our leaders each night kind of, you know, take you through um, maybe what God did in their hearts and maybe challenge you uh, to, to dig a little deeper into this journey. So we're excited about it. We think it's cool. It's something we've never done here at The Edge. And, um, and we think that if you really believe that Jesus died for you and saved you, you should be willing to spend some time with him. All right? So I'd encourage you to, uh, to do that. It was about, about a month ago now. I was, at, I was going up to Oak Bridge City to play basketball with my little brother and Jeremiah. And, uh, and it was so much fun. And I had a really good time. I love playing basketball up there. Uh, but but uh, I, I had this random idea before we went up there to, uh, to, 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 to scare whoever was going to fall victim to this kind of attack that I was going to put on them. And so what I did was, is I live pretty close to the city location. We have an awesome gym in there. I texted Colby and I said, I'm not going to be there until like 10 minutes after you guys get there. All right. So I texted him that and then I called my dad and said, I'm going to be there before you guys I'm gonna hide in this bin where the balls are, and I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna text I'm gonna text them that the ball is in the bin, and when they open up the bin, I'm gonna pop out. Okay, and so honestly, random idea, but I was like giddy. I was so excited because I knew there was literally no possible way that something awesome wasn't gonna happen. Like there was no possible way. There, there's literally none of you in here would 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 like all of you would have been scared. Okay, it would have been possible not to. All right. So I text Colby again. And I'm like. 
like, leaving my house right now. I knew they were pulling in. Leaving my house right now. I'll see you there in about 10 minutes. The basketball is in the bin. And so I'm, like, literally in this little bin, okay, laying in the bin. It's pitch black. It's tight. It's uncomfortable, but I am so excited. And I hear him walking down the hallways, and Jeremiah sits on top of the bin. And so I'm just trying to be super quiet. I'm trying to be, like, you know, like, real still to where he doesn't feel me moving in there, hear me breathing in there. And then my dad saved the day because they both had basketballs. And my dad's like, I want to shoot. Reach in there, get a basketball, and throw it to me. And so, so, so Jeremiah, who's like the, one of the chillest, like most laid back guys in the world, opens up this bin and I pop out and I scream. And the reaction was everything that I had hoped for. Like his eyes got super big. He popped back and his natural reaction was to clench his fists and he was ready to fight me. Literally, he was like this. And we didn't get it on tape, which is a super big bummer, but it was an extraordinary moment in my life. It really was. One of the best moments ever. And the reason that I, I share that is because... I just knew, like I was excited, I was giddy because I knew something awesome was going to happen. And honestly, as we've been making this devotional, as I saw these books, I, I'm a little bit giddy, I'm a little bit excited because I know that there's literally no possible way that something awesome won't happen if you actually do it. Like if you spend time with God every day, if you make it a priority to be up here for, for all four weeks, I believe wholeheartedly that something amazing is going to take place in your life and in the life of our student ministry, and I think God could use it to make a massive impact in what, um, in what, in what he wants to do through you uh, at your school and in your life and here in our ministry. And so you all ready? Are we going to go on the journey together a little bit? Okay. Hopefully you can commit to doing it. I'm, I'm excited about it. Uh, tell your leaders to help hold you accountable. It's going to be really good. And this journey that we're going on is based out of the book of Philippians. It's a letter to a church in Philippi, and it's written by a guy named Paul, okay? And Paul, when he writes this letter, is in prison, okay? Not only is he in prison, but a lot of theologians believe that he was essentially like on 24-7 watch. He was like chained to a Roman guard, and, and there was a constant threat of execution at this point in his life and ministry. He didn't know if he was going to die. And so, this kind of takes up, like, it takes his words up a notch, right? Like, when he says there's peace in spite of circumstances, when he says that there's, when he says that there is, you know, like, like, there's joy, even in the midst of trials and difficulties, like, 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 he's actually living it out. I mean, he's going through a difficult time, he's in prison, and he's serving people instead of it. And so I hope that that kind of like encourages you, like if Paul could live with peace and joy in this stage of his life, you can too. You can actually live out, um, live out these words that we're going to focus on. And so I'm going to give you a really kind of a short message tonight that hopefully just gets you thinking and kind of frames the rest of our series together and the rest of this journey together. And I think the reason that Paul could have hope and peace in spite of a bunch of different circumstances, you know, whether whatever was going on in his life, is because he says this in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 21, and it says this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I forgot to do something, so I'm going to do something real quick with you guys one more time, okay? So, so, Maybe a lot of you have never even read your Bible, okay? And so what I want you guys to do, if you've never read your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, download the Bible app, okay? Download the Bible app on your phone. It's the Version Bible app, okay? If you have a Bible, I've been, I'd encourage you to read that hard copy. I know when I read my Bible on my phone, I get distracted and I end up on Instagram, all right? And so, so I'd encourage you to maybe read hard copy and Whatever you do, go to the table of contents, whether it's in the version or in your Bible. It's like first couple pages, table of contents, and just look for Philippians. Look for Philippians. And Philippians is in the New Testament. It's a letter. You'll flip to that. The book is, divi is divided into chapters. So Philippians 1.21 means Philippians chapter 1, and then the chapters are, divi are, are, are divided into verses, okay? And so Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, all right? And so, it's, it, you know, a lot of you guys, maybe if you never read your Bible, it's like Philippians 1, 21, you're like, I don't even know how to get there, all right? So that's what it is. Go to the table of contents. It'll take you right there. And Paul says in Philippians 1, 21, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And I believe that this was a framework, this was a mindset that he had throughout his life. And so some of you are like, okay, that's great. That sounds cute, but it sounds real spiritual and theoretical. What does that look like in the practical? What does that mean? And so essentially what Paul is saying here is that for me, every area of my life has Jesus on it. 
every area of my life has Jesus in it. He, he's over it. He's, he's, he's guiding it. He's Lord over all in my life. Paul essentially is, is saying, I'm, I'm not the captain of my own life. I'm not the Lord over my own life. Jesus is, and I'm going to follow him. And there's going to be every, literally every aspect of my life is going to be wrapped up in Jesus. And, 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 and this is not normal, okay? This is not normal. The series title is Normal Isn't Working. Normal isn't working. And let's acknowledge right now that this mindset isn't normal. And our hope that in this series, verses like this, conversations like this can open our hearts up and our minds up to a brand new world. Literally, like a, you know, I was going to sing it, but I'm, I'm not feeling it tonight. But like a, a world where you can like literally step into like a new reality, something that's different, something that's better, something that Jesus offers to you. And I believe that it happens through verses like this. And can we just acknowledge like what's normal today in, your, in, in our generation? Like, let's think about what's normal for a lot of kids, for the majority of students. The norm for a lot of people is high rates of depression and anxiety. The norm in our world is addiction to social media. The norm in our world is an obsession with what other people think about us. The norm in our world is pornography viewage from a very early age. The norm in our world is confusion about sexuality. The norm in our world is negativity. The norm in our world is tearing other people down with gossip and slander to where we can feel better about ourselves. The norm in our world is a lack of faith in God. The norm in our world is a lack of self-worth. The norm in our world is isolation. The norm in our world is selfishness. The norm in our world is fear. And I believe that as we read these verses... These passages, I believe we need stuff like this because, again, it allows us to see a different way to live, a better way to live as we do our best to follow Jesus. Paul says, for me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Again, the first part of this, to live is Christ, means that every area of my life is going to revolve around him, and this is not normal. In fact, there are two kind of leading worldviews that, whether you know it or not, are being shoved down your throat in middle school and high school through media, um, through movies that you watch, from songs that you sing. And the first one is this, personal autonomy. Personal autonomy. And essentially what this teaches is that you can do with your time what you want. You can do with your life what you want. You can do with your talents what you want. You can do with your treasures what you want. You can do with your world what you want to do with your world. And not only can you, but you should. You should. If you give into the lie that there's an authority over your life, really you're just kind of weak and you're superstitious, you, you, you should take control of your own life and do whatever you want to do. I read a post on social media lately. It was a birthday post, okay? I know it's really cute when all y'all do that on Instagram. You know, it's like if it's birthday, you aren't a real friend if you don't, if you don't shout them out on Instagram. I think it's great. I think it's very nice. And so, 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 so there's a girl who was turning 20 years old, 20 years old, and one of her friends posted, posted, your, your, your 20s are your selfish years, okay? Your 20s are your selfish years. Do whatever you want to do. Go wherever you want to go. Like, live the, the life that you want to live. They're your selfish years. Make them about you. And I'm not like blaming her for posting it because again, this is, this is what our world is saturated with, but it, it caused me to think, so wait, your 20s are just the year where you just don't follow Jesus because that message is 100% contrary to the message of Jesus. But this is what personal autonomy teaches. And the reason that we have personal autonomy is that we bought into another lie and it's self-sufficiency. And what this teaches is that everything you need is found in you yourself. The wisdom you need, all the peace you need, all the direction you need, it's just found on the inside of you. You are enough. You are all that you need. And if others come along, great. If not, who needs them? It's me against the world. I'm the only one I need to live the life that I desire to live. But these ideas, while normal, are, are crazy if you actually take them to mean what they're really saying. I mean, could you imagine if I came up here and said, do whatever you feel like doing? Like tonight, how many of you guys drive? How many of y'all drive? Okay. Imagine if I said, hey, when you're going home, when you're going home, do whatever you feel like when it comes to how you drive. 
If you don't want to go the speed limit, don't go the speed limit. If you want to text and drive, text and drive. Okay, well, some of y'all are going to do that anyway. You got to stop. Okay, I almost got hit this morning. It was a student texting and driving. It's not just students who do it. Quit doing it, all right? And, 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 and if you want, just do whatever you want. Do you know what would happen? Chaos would ensue. I mean, goodness gracious, we'd have kids going 100 miles per hour. We'd have, again, kids texting and driving. It would be absolutely wild, and people would die. Physically, it would be, it would be an absolute train wreck. And then think about self-sufficiency, okay? If we really believe this, just for you to live your physical life, the physical life that you're living right now, think of how many other people you rely on. How many of you guys have electricity? You have water. You eat food that you don't kill yourself, right? I mean, like, practically, it just doesn't make sense. You, you, you are not enough to live the life that you've created to live physically. Now, if spiritual, if spirituality is much more important, if the spiritual realm is much more important than the physical realm, think of how damaging it must be to say, do whatever you want to do. Live however you want to live. Like, whatever you're feeling in the moment, do it. This would be extraordinarily damaging emotionally and spiritually if you live a life apart from, from what God is telling you to do. Paul essentially knows this, and this is so important, and it's countercultural. It's not normal, but normal isn't working. He says there's a better way, and it's not personal autonomy because I am not enough. It is relying on Jesus because he's always enough. And so what would it look like? What would it look like if you said every day when you woke up, to go to school is Christ. To go eat lunch is Christ. To date a boyfriend or girlfriend is Christ. To be a friend is Christ. To play basketball or football is Christ. To, to be in theater, to be in band, to be in clubs is Christ. To practice my faith is Christ. To do my homework is Christ. To honor my parents is Christ. To live out my weekends is Christ. What, what, what would it look like if you said the motto of my life is that every area of it is going to be saturated in Jesus and the life that he calls me to live? I believe you would find a life that is not normal, but it is way better. It's something way better. It's a life that you have been designed to live. And then the second part, this is kind of interesting to me as I was thinking about this verse this week, is to die is gain. To die is gain. Okay, he says, for me, and the same is true for us, if Christ has been your life, okay, if you love Jesus and you know that Jesus loves you, you won't fear death anymore. While it's a mystery, and because we're not originally made to die, there might be some sadness and some confusion when people pass away and all of that, but in the midst of the mystery and the ache in our souls that lets us know this isn't the way that it's supposed to be, there can be some expectancy and even some excitement, because when I die, I get to meet the one who I made my life to be all about. I get to see the face of the one who I was living for. I get to see Jesus, right? But again, that seems pretty spiritual and a little bit theoretical, and what does that look like in real life? And so, so here's how it looks, okay? And I don't want to get this wrong. If you aren't afraid of death, if your life is all about Jesus and, 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 and you are and, 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 you know, and you're so all about Jesus to the point where you know that death is an upgrade, one theologian says, if that's the case, you'll stop fearing people who can kill the body, which Jesus tells us to do. He says, don't fear people who can kill the body. Fear the one who can kill both body and soul in, in, in hell. And so, so this, is, this is one of his teachings. And if you don't fear people who can kill the body, that means you aren't going to fear anybody. You aren't going to be obsessed with what other people think about you. And when you stop fearing people, and when you stop worrying about the approval of others, you can actually begin to, li to live the life that God has called you to live. But this isn't normal, okay? This isn't normal, but normal isn't working, okay? In middle school, I would say pretty much the biggest struggle, in high school, pretty much the biggest struggle that I had, that a lot of you guys have, is you're going to constantly worry, if you're not careful, about what other people think about you. What do they think about this outfit? What do they think about this social media post? That's why a lot of you take them down, if there aren't enough likes. Right? Like, what do people think about my boyfriend or girlfriend? What do people think about me? What do people think about my faith? What do people think about me? 
The reason why I stopped following Jesus in high school is because I feared what a girl thought about me, okay? There's an eight-month stint, my senior year, where I didn't really care at all about following Jesus. Do you know the genesis of that? There was a girl that I thought was pretty, found out she liked me, and I didn't want her to think that I was super boring, and so I said, you know what? I'm going to worry more about what she thinks about me than I am what God thinks about me. And so I began to live a life that everyone else lives. But normal didn't work for me. Fearing people did not work. When I fell into the trap, it simply didn't work. My biggest regrets, my lack of influence over people in high school came from fearing people. The proverb writer says this in Proverbs 29, 25. Fearing people is a dangerous trap. It's a dangerous trap. Super dangerous. If you begin to fear people, you're going to get tripped up. You're going to get, you, you're going to fall into stuff that you deep down know you shouldn't be falling into. Fearing people, the fear of man, will prove to be a snare. But trusting the Lord means safety. And so as we close, could you honestly say, like, could you even come close to saying what Paul says there? To live as Christ, does your life, the way that you talk to people, the way that you hang out with people, the way that you do the weekends, the way that you do dating, the way that you do your homework, the way that you talk to your parents. Is that about Jesus? The way that you do your sports, like all that, is, is that, is that about Jesus or is it about you? Is it about you? Are you just kind of living the way that the world tells you to live? It's not working. And then lastly, could you honestly say, I'm not worried about what people think about me. I'm not worried about it. I'm not stressed out about it. I'm going to live the life that God calls me to live, and I'm not going to worry about what other people think about me. And I think that if we begin to do this, middle school and high school, we'll, we'll begin to live a life that actually works, that makes sense. world where we can step into peace and joy and hope in the midst of circumstances. I'm excited as we go on this journey to hopefully maybe step more and more into that motto that Paul had to where maybe that, be, that can become our motto as well. I'm excited to be back here next week. Trey Craig is going to speak. So we're going to put that on the screen, put that up there. Can we put his, can we put his, can we put his, can we put his face on the screen? Okay. Wow. He literally looks so good. He looks so good. He's extraordinary looking. And, and, and so honestly, like, like, like guys in the room, okay, if you want to learn how to be cool, if you want to learn how to maybe eventually be like that guy, you need to invite your friends, you need to be here, you want to be like Trey Craig, okay? Ladies, okay? Ladies, all right, you have a great reason to invite your friends. You say, listen, hey, hey, the best looking guy on this side of the Mississippi is preaching, okay? So make sure that you get him here. Some of y'all are like, does he have, does he have a girlfriend? He does, but it, there, there ain't a ring on that finger yet, all right? Hey, hey. <laughs> I'm just kidding. His girlfriend's over there. I was so looking forward to saying that. Um, but, uh, but anyways, uh, I really am excited to hear what he has to say. My goal this semester is to get some different voices up here and have a good time together. So seriously, invite some friends next week. Let's be back. I'm fired up. My goal was to be done at 6.55. It is 6.54. We're going to go to small groups after I pray, all right? Father, we love you, and we are grateful for who you are and, uh, and for what you've done and for your love and your grace and your kindness towards us. And because you're so good, Father, as a student, even though it's difficult and it's challenging, we can give our whole lives to you. Father, the best way to live would, would be for all of us, and I'm not there yet, but it would be so amazing if all of us could say, for, 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 for me, to live is Christ. Every area of my life revolves around him. And Father, because you're so good, because we love you, there is no reason to fear what is ahead and there sure, they're, they're, they're surely is no reason to fear what other people think about us. And so, Father, I pray that we can be bold, we can become bolder in the next four weeks, that we can love you a little bit more, that we can follow you a little bit more, and we, be, and we can become more like you so that we can shine, that, that, that we can shine the light of Jesus in our schools and wherever you've called us to occupy. We love you. We're grateful for you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Hey, seriously.
Let's do this together. It's going to be awesome. If you don't know where you're going, go to the info desk, and uh, we'll get you plugged in to your small groups.